Welcome to the dark heart of Hollywood, where the glitz and glamour conceal chilling secrets and unimaginable horrors. I'm Robin Todd, and this is Real Hollywood Horrors. In this spine-tingling series, we will descend into the abyss of fame, uncovering the shocking tales of celebrities who have walked the line between the silver screen and pure terror. These are not just stories, they are nightmarish journeys that blur the boundaries of reality and fiction, ripped straight from the pages of Hollywood's darkest scripts. Starring a host of familiar faces who went from the glaring blaze of the spotlight to the darkest shadows of crime. These are tales of ambition gone awry, secrets hidden beneath the glamour, and the harrowing descent from stardom to infamy. Get ready to delve into the dark chapters that Hollywood tried to erase and the crimes that rocked the entertainment world. In this episode, we explore the chilling tale of Sid Vicious, the punk rock icon who became entangled in a murder that shocked the world. Born John Simon Ritchie on May 10, 1957, in London, England, Sid Vicious rose to fame as the bassist of the iconic punk rock band, The Sex Pistols, his rebellious attitude and raw energy made him a symbol of the punk movement. Enter Nancy Spungen, a troubled American groupie known for her tumultuous relationship with Sid. Born in 1958 to an upper-middle-class family in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, diagnosed with schizophrenia by the time she was 11 years old, her teen years saw her seek solace from drugs. She moved out at 17, began stripping, and eventually becoming a groupie of sorts to punk bands, which is how she met Vicious. Their intense bond would ultimately lead to both their tragic and mysterious deaths. On October 12, 1978, the world was stunned when Nancy Spungen was found dead in their room at New York City's Chelsea Hotel with a stab wound to her abdomen. Sid Vicious, in a drug-induced haze, was immediately arrested and charged with her murder. The circumstances surrounding Nancy's death were murky at best. Was it a drug-fueled argument gone awry, or was there something more sinister at play? Vicious was interviewed by police in the hallway of the Chelsea, as well as in a conference room on the hotel premises. Initially, he stated to officers that he had no idea what happened to Nancy. He just woke up and found her dead. The police were not convinced. After further interrogation, Vicious started making up scenarios about the possibility of Spungen rolling over on the knife while in bed, accidentally stabbing herself before finally confessing to the murder. He was then arrested. While being handcuffed, Vicious went back to claiming he was innocent of the murder. Days later, he was charged with second-degree murder and given a $58,000 bond, which was promptly paid by Virgin Records. Vicious would find himself with a revoked bail in the next few weeks for a bar fight in which he attacked a man with a broken beer bottle. But again, he bailed out on $10,000. In between his arrests, he also tried to commit suicide by slitting his wrists, but was discovered by someone and taken to the hospital. Friends and bandmates were divided over Sid's innocence, and the media frenzy intensified as the investigation progressed, a trial imminent. All that changed on February 1st, 1979. Vicious had been released on bail after serving 55 days in jail and gone through a detoxification program. Vicious had a small get-together at a friend's house to celebrate his jail release. At the friend's home, Vicious had his mother look for heroin for him, which she later delivered to him. Vicious, believing the drug was too weak, asked his friend Peter Gravel to get him some more. Gravel distributed the heroin to Vicious, which was reportedly 98% pure, far too strong for human consumption. Vicious would overdose shortly after shooting up the heroin, but friends were able to revive him. Vicious ended up taking more of the drug and was found dead by his mother the following morning, four months after Spungen's death. He was 21 years old. With the death of Vicious, investigators closed the case on Spungen's death. No further investigation was ever done. After Vicious died from an overdose, his mother, Anne Beverly, found a suicide note in her son's possessions. In the letter, Vicious explains that he wants to reunite with Nancy. This letter also states the couple made a pact, leading friends to believe that the two actually made a suicide pact that went wrong. We know that Vicious tried to slit his wrists in the weeks after Spungen's death, and the couple did tell an interviewer for a magazine that they planned to kill themselves months before their deaths. 
Beverly contacted Spungen's parents after finding the note, asking if Vicious could be buried beside Spungen, but her parents refused to allow it. Beverly got Vicious cremated and secretly sprinkled his ashes over Nancy's grave. Was it a suicide pact gone wrong? Over the years, numerous theories and conspiracies have emerged. Some believe Nancy's death was accidental, while others claim that a third party was involved. Days before Spungen's death, the couple had come into quite a bit of money. Vicious had just been paid in cash his royalties for the remake of Sinatra's song My Way. He had also been doing quite a few solo performances around New York, including several at Max's Kansas City, a famous hangout of New York artists, where he was paid $4,000 per show. Friends of the couple all report that Vicious had quite a bit of money at the point of the murder, and at times he would reprimand Spungen for carrying around a significant amount of cash, since she would be seen dropping $100 bills all over the floor while in public. It was estimated the couple had around $24,000 in the hotel the night Spungen was killed. But it was not in the room when the police arrived after her murder. The money was never recovered, and while some say police may have taken it, or that the idea of such a vast sum is laughable to have been there to begin with. Others believe the money could have been a motive for the crime, which would rule out Vicious as the killer. Rocket's Red Glare, whose real name is Michael Mora, was an actor and comedian who sometimes worked as a bodyguard for artist John michel Basquiat and Sid Vicious. Red Glare was also in the business of selling pills, and allegedly, Spungen called Red Glare around 2.30 a.m., the morning of her death, asking for some Dilaudid pills. Some claim that Red Glare was one of the last to be seen at the Chelsea Hotel the day Spungen died, and that it's possible he was responsible for her murder. Phil Strongman, author of Pretty Vacant, A History of Punk, believes Red Glare is responsible for Spungen's death. Strongman notes that while Red Glare was at the club CBGB's in 1978, he admitted to other patrons that he was responsible for robbing and killing Spungen. And he even went as far as producing some dollar bills with blood on them as evidence. Police never spoke to Red Glare during their investigation, despite him visiting the hotel room the day of Spungen's death. Red Glare died in 2001 from kidney failure, liver failure, cirrhosis and hepatitis C at the age of 52, taking the truth of his knowledge of the events that night with him. Another interesting theory regarding Spungen's death to emerge places the blame on a mysterious man who is only known as Michael. Not to be confused with Rockets, but drawing similar parallels, Michael was a young drug dealer who had befriended Nancy and who was staying on the sixth floor of the Chelsea Hotel. According to several of the couple's friends, he was frequently with them the days leading up to Nancy's musician Neon Leon, who himself had been with the couple on the night she was slain, recalls a phone conversation with Nancy, estimated to be shortly before the murder occurred, in which he could hear the man he knew as Michael talking in the background. Another resident of the Chelsea, Victor Colicchio, also stopped at the couple's door shortly before the stabbing and corroborated this, stating that Michael was inside. According to the roommates of this mysterious man, who has never been able to be formally identified other than a skecht drawn from memory by former musician Steve Dior, Michael returned to his place at the Chelsea smiling, saying that Spungen was in a body bag and that Vicious had killed her. Michael was carrying a large wad of cash which was tied up with Nancy's purple hair tie. The roommates told others they shared the information about Michael with the police, but nothing ever came up. Michael ended up checking out of the Chelsea Hotel shortly after and was never seen or heard from again. Alan G. Parker, a British documentary filmmaker who has investigated the murder for over 24 years, made a film claiming to have spoken to several witnesses who are adamant that Vicious was innocent. Crucially, Parker says police found the fingerprints of six people who had been in the couple's room at New York's rundown Chelsea Hotel in the early hours but none was ever interviewed. One witness, who subsequently became a priest, tried to tell detectives that he thought Vicious was not the murderer, but was given the brush off by investigating officers. Rumors that some of the investigating officers 
even doubted Vicious's ability to have even wielded the knife that tore through Nancy's abdomen, as medical tests carried out on Vicious at the time of his arrest suggested the musician would have been incapable of the attack, because he was out cold at the time after taking so much of a powerful sedative that it would have killed all but the most hard-bitten drug users. Recently, Glenn Matlock, the original bassist for the band, gave an interview in which he claimed to know full well that Sid didn't kill Nancy. He refers to multiple friends and witnesses present in the building with no reason to lie and alludes to the dangerous people they associated with at the time. Of course, it's also possible Spungin may have killed herself. Musician and disc jockey Howie Pyro, who was with Vicious the night he died, believes that Spungin was probably responsible for her own death. He has stated that he does not believe Spungin was above stabbing herself just to try to get Vicious's attention. Both Spungin and Vicious were known to self-mutilate, and her stabbing herself without realizing the devastating consequences cannot be ruled out. The case remains a subject of speculation, with questions about what truly transpired that fateful night still unanswered. While the motive and murderer remains shrouded in mystery, even after all these years, what remains true is that two young, promising rebels lost their lives, one in a horrifying attack and the other from the deep despair and void left by the trauma. Join us next time as we uncover more tales of celebrities whose actions have left a trail of darkness and intrigue in the world of showbiz. In our next episode, we'll dive into the twisted world of another Hollywood icon, where the lines between horror and reality blur. Until then, remember, beneath the veneer of fame, there exists a realm of terror where the unthinkable becomes reality.